my talk today is called Categories and Characteristics and Constraints of User Testing. Um, what I want to start off today looking at is a question that I've heard asked before in meetings and retrospectives. Um, it's taken a couple of different forms, but the gist of it is usually something along the lines of this. Uh, so it says, we did user testing on this project, why didn't it succeed? Um, this is kind of a loaded question, and there's a lot to take apart in this. Um, so the first part is obviously saying just user testing here generically, there's a lot behind that. Um, as well as success. So what were the metrics for success here? Um, it could have been a specific financial return on investment. It might have been an improvement in member satisfaction that we were looking for. It might have been just a certain level of market penetration. Um, and then user testing, there are all sorts of forms and shapes of that. Um, user interviews to focus groups, usability testing, qualitative research, um, A-B testing, multivariate testing, and all of those happen at different stages and have different outcomes. Um, so when I hear a question like this, I think it kind of speaks to a disconnect between both sides of a product team. Um, you, have, you might have designers and researchers who um, don't know what the success metrics are, so they're not requesting the right type of research for that, or they might just be doing research and then not sharing what the outcome of it is it might seem like a black box to the rest of the product team. Um, and then the product managers and owners, on the other side of things, um, aren't aware of what type of testing they're getting and what kind of questions each type of testing can answer. Um, so that's the goal of this talk, is just to explore a bit of the breadth of what's out there in terms of user testing um, and to examine the relative strengths and weaknesses of the different types. I always like to start off with what user testing isn't. Um, so it's not conformance testing, which is something that would check for compliance or do some sort of audit, make sure that it's got the right certifications. You can't certify that it's user tested necessarily. Um, it's also not a heuristic usability evaluation. So if you were to do that, that's more along the lines of some outside professional who's not actually a user comes in and says, hey, here are usability standards that we adhere to, um, this does or does not conform to those. It can be a part of market research, but it is not in itself market research. Um, and then it's not user acceptance testing. I know the names are similar, and that's a big one that comes up a lot. People hear that they did user acceptance testing and then think that they've done user testing and they're not the same thing. That is literally um, a person who's looking at what is appearing on the web versus a comp of what should appear and just confirming that this thing looks like that. It doesn't test whether or not it's usable or anything along those lines. Um, for what it is, like I said, could be user interviews, could be usability testing, A-B testing, multivariate or multinomial testing, um, qualitative research, other things as well. These are the four that I'm going to focus on today in this talk um, because I think they present a pretty good spectrum across um, the beginning and the end of the process. So to start off with, I've got user interviews. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about what it does, what the format is, what the techniques are that you might use, and what the goals of it would be. Um, so it's meant to uncover motivations and routines for potential users for your product. Um, and in terms of formatting, it's usually carefully outlined, but highly flexible. So they've got questions in mind that they want to present to people to elicit certain responses, um, but a good researcher also is able to move outside of those strictures um, because, as we know, conversations with people can change. Um, their techniques generally are to like make the user feel comfortable, just listen to what they have to say, and to ask for clarification. That, is typically um, done through a process that they call the five whys. So anytime they have a response, you ask why five times to try to get really to the core of what they're talking about. Um, the goal is really to shape personas and journey maps to contribute to a larger picture of market viability and to directly influence the design of a product. So a lot of times this happens very, very early in the process. Um, even before 
a solution has been engineered, you might want to um, go out there and do some customer interviews to shape the identity of that product. To go on about the strengths and weaknesses of this specifically, um, like I said, it's able to be initiated really early in the product lifecycle, and it allows the team to pivot really quickly. So they can quickly make decisions like, hey, we want to pivot away from this product entirely, or this is the direction that we want to take with it instead. Um, it's formatted to allow the interviewers to adapt, dig deeper, and observe social cues. So something that you will find as I go through this testing that you lose toward the tail end of this is you're not talking directly to the person anymore, so you're losing a lot of the social cues. Um, and you're no longer able to really observe their behaviors. You're only able to see the outcomes. Um, but here you can actually observe all of that. And it gives you a fuller understanding of who the user is than any of the other methodologies. So it's really about that person, the ethnography, understanding who your users are. Um, and it also produces reusable learnings. So the things that are takeaways from this, the personas, the journey maps, all of that can be reused for product after product. That's not the case with things that come up later down the line. The weaknesses inherent to it, um, it can be really time intensive to properly moderate and observe each user individually. And it requires a highly trained researcher with well-developed interviewing skills to notice, record, and react to social cues. This is the one that requires the most practiced researcher um, because these things can go off the rails really quickly if you don't know what you're doing. Um, you need to know how to ask non-leading questions um, and you can't just show up to an interview session with no plan. The other part is that it may be prone to people-pleasing behavior on the part of the interviewee. So if they know that they're being compensated by Humana for an interview, they may be prone to tell us what they think we want to hear um, instead of what they actually feel. The next one I'm gonna go over is usability. Oh, did, sorry, that's the other question, anyway. Um, the next one I'm gonna go over is usability testing. Um, that involves systematically observing user interactions with the product to evaluate how well a member or a user can use it. Um, it consists of typically crafting a scenario. So you'll have like a script ready and you'll say, hey, this is a scenario that this type of user that I've recruited would typically encounter. Um, and then here is the piece of software or the product or whatever that they would encounter as part of that journey. Um, and so they'll walk through that and you'll be prompted with a series of tasks to complete. Um, again, the techniques are similar. You just need to make the user feel comfortable, and then they usually enact what's called like the think aloud protocol, um, where they say, hey, like as you're walking through this, just express your thoughts externally um, so that we can record that. Again, um, this has a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses as the customer interviews. So, the first that is exceptional beyond that is that it easily conforms to the sprint cadence of an engineering team. So it's actually one of the easiest ones to implement as part of your daily routine um, because it has a similar cadence. Like you're always designing and then testing and then making changes and coming back over and over again. So there's a cycle to it that can align with what the development team is doing. Um, it also allows for detection of usability issues early in the development pipeline when change is cheaper, relatively speaking. Um, it's never super cheap, but at least at that point, um, you haven't invested in the full product development. The team has already ramped up. Um, they're good to go and they can make those changes on the fly. Uh, it also provides a window into behaviors beyond basic clicks and gives users an avenue to explain their actions. So on the next two that we get to, A, B, and multivariate, you get real interactions versus here where you're kind of creating a performative scenario, but you don't get any of the feedback from members about why they're doing what they're doing or what they're trying to achieve. Um, in terms of weaknesses, it tends to produce exclusionary results from which insights have to be synthesized. So what that means is that it doesn't tell you what to do, it tells you what not to do. 
So you can find out what's not working in the design, but you don't have a clear avenue forward for what exactly I'm supposed to do to make it better. Um, that's why the whole process is iterative. Every time you come back uh, with new insights, you have to send it back through uh, usability testing again to make sure that what you changed it to is actually functioning better than what you had before. Um, it also typically takes place in a controlled environment, which might impact how users interact with the product. Um, they're not on their computer, they're not on their phone. A lot of times they're just using whatever you have there available with the prototype loaded on it. Um, so a lot of times usability issues can arise with just not being familiar um, with the piece of hardware or again, because it's a controlled environment, a lot of times they prepare beforehand, knowing that they're coming in, and they'll say, oh, like I went on the site and looked around a little bit um, to make sure that I was all set and prepared for uh, this test. It can also be difficult to convey the results and benefits to those outside the team if they're not really, really painstakingly documented. So it's kind of a, it has a feeling of like, hey, you had to be there. Um, when you start talking about usability testing results to people outside the team. Um, and I found that people can get a little bit irritated if you keep saying, well, the user said this and this and that. And they're like, well, what users? Where's the research? Where's the documentation around this? Um, it really is something that you kind of have to work with the team and experience, or else you just have to take extreme care. And then that document that is the output is extremely dense for someone else to get through. Next is A-B testing. Um, it's also called split run testing. It's an A-B test. Uh, an A-B test is randomized, um, and it serves one of two options to the user. Um, one is the control, one is the test. And basically, one or the other ends up winning. Um, it compares two variations of a single variable, and it produces actual measurable quantitative results versus the others before, which were more on the qualitative side of things. In terms of its string, again, produces intelligible, quantifiable results that are easy to report and act on. So I can easily flip the switch to switch over to whichever option one, um, and I can easily report those results to someone at a higher level who isn't familiar with what the team's been doing. Um, it also tracks actual user behavior in a live environment rather than implied behavior. So a lot of the other ones um, before this, people will imply that they might do something and you just have to trust them on that in the context of the research. Um, or you have to read social cues and say, hmm, they might have been not totally honest about that. Whereas this, you're looking at real results. It can also lead to swift decisive action that immediately benefits the bottom line. Weaknesses, um, this requires a single clear key performance indicator in order to be used most effectively. So, um, for example, if we think about our own homepage, do we want people to sign in or do we want them to buy insurance? Um, and there are competing KPIs on that page. So it's really difficult to like optimize both of those and decide what the weight to each should be, um, especially if you're not looking beyond the surface at what like the drop-off rates are. So if you're looking just at those like A, B percents of this percent of people clicked here, um, when I made the button blue and versus when it was plum, but like were they getting to the right place? We don't know. Um, and it can be too reliant on specific hypotheses that if poorly conceived may negatively impact future design decisions. Um, this one <coughs> Is, is a bit frustrating for me. So a lot of times like the hypotheses that are attached to this are just something like, hey, if the button's plumb, I think it'll do better. Well, that hypothesis might be why it performs better. It might not. Um, it's more correlative than causal once that's proven true. And it has wide ranging implications potentially for the rest of the work that you're doing in the future because people will say, well, that plum did better that one time on that test, every button going forward should be plum or whatever color it might be. Um, so just gotta be careful about that. It's also prone to data misuse if the results are reported in isolation. So again, you have to contextualize it. 
if you, it's really easy to report to somebody that like, hey, I got a 5% increase on click through on this, and that's gonna translate to X million dollars. Um, but you have to contextualize it with um, drop off rates, um, whether or not people actually completed the entire process, um, or if they're just stumbling into that button accidentally now that it's the major button on the page. Um, next up is multivariate. So this is also called multinomial. Um, and it's kind of like just doing a lot of A-B tests together. Um, and there are different ways to design it. One way is factorial design where you do every single possible combination of those different variables that you're testing and test all of those. If it's a lot of variables, that can be really, really massive <laughs> of an undertaking. Um, other ways are to do it in waves, so you can do like a few at a time, and then once you've settled on those few, you can introduce another few behind that. Um, this falls victim to a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses as A-B testing, but in terms of strength, like I said, it combines several A-B tests, essentially, um, so you can get information more quickly if you do a lot of these together. It's also really powerful if you combine it with personalization to gauge the effectiveness of offers made to users. So in combination with personalization, you can say like, hey, I'm serving like these types of offers to all of these different people. Who is it most effective to serve this offer to? Um, so it just becomes a powerful tool there. And as with AB, it can lead to quick action. Weaknesses. Um, it takes a lot longer than A-B testing to reach a statistically valid result if you're trying to go through like the entire factorial process at once. Um, and some places with less traffic may never reach a statistically valid result at all. Um, it often relies on tweaking elements that are historically known to produce high ROI. So a lot of times, because it's so complex, they'll say, well, we're going to stick to changing the banner image or changing the color or changing um, the font because we know that those are things that somehow have this intangible impact on the ROI. So we'll just like tweak those things around and they don't really test anything that's out of the box. Um, it can also be difficult to report the results and tie the results to a coherent hypothesis. Um, again, just because there's so much going on here, it's not, it's, I would say it's like less complex than reporting the results of a usability test, but it's exponentially more complex than simply reporting an A-B result. Um, so now that we've looked at a few different types of testing, I think the best way to compare them, aside from just looking at these pro and con lists, is to um, cast them across a couple of different spectra. Um, and the order in which I discussed them earlier is also the order in which I think they fall for this discussion. Um, so first, I want to look at um, the type of user feedback collected. So this one falls along a spectrum of qualitative to quantitative. And again, the order here is user interviews, usability testing, AV, and multivariate. Um, for the qualitative side of things, it's really concerned um, with the meaning behind things and the definition of concepts um, or characteristics, whereas on the quantitative side, it's concerned with counting or measuring. Um, I think also there's just like on this side, it's more like the ineffable quality of learning versus tangible um, outcomes. So over here, you may not be able to state exactly why, like what all of these learnings are clearly. Whereas over here, you can say like, I learned this specific thing, this percent. Um, but that's that. Um, next is the number of users required to reach an inflection point. So on this side, it's relatively few. Over there, relatively many. Um, and one of the, I say inflection point here instead of just straight number of users because I think that this graphic gets used a lot, um, which is specifically for usability testing where they say the number of um, usability issues detected against the number of users um, and they say, you know, like, by the time you get to five users, you'll have a ton of usability issues already detected, but that's at a single inflection point. So you wouldn't just 
necessarily, unless I guess the budget only allowed this, you wouldn't just do a test with five users. This would be in one cycle um, where you hit an inflection point and then you make changes and then you do this over again. So yes, like still relatively speaking, you might have hundreds of usability test users versus tens of thousands of AB and multivariate test users, um, but you wouldn't just stop at five as this sometimes seems to indicate because you still have to like hit inflection points over and over again. And it's the same with customer interviews. So you'll work on uh, percent journey maps and then uh, you'll go back and reassess them. Next is the cost to implement proposed changes or course corrections. So it's over on this side, relatively cheaper, over on that side, relatively more expensive. Um, and it's basically just the earlier that you have findings, the less expensive it is to implement them. Um, while the individual tests on this side might take more time, so like sitting down and doing a customer interview or doing a usability test it takes more time than collecting hundreds of clicks on an A-B test, fewer people on the business side are involved. So over here, it's just you know the product and research team. Um, over here, maybe engineering is starting to get involved while usability testing is happening. Over here, the team's already rolled off, um, and now you have to involve a ton of people, plus for each of these, you're creating multiple test scenarios. So not only am I like having to do redo, I'm having to do it twice here and multiple times over here. Um, and then you have to engage with the entire AV and multivariate testing structure. So there's um, you know, systems in place that allow those to be served to different people as well. And so all of that has to be interacted with. The cost is just um, much higher over on the right. Uh, next is about how learnings can shape the design practice. Um, so I've got broadly and situationally. Again, the learnings over here you can apply to basically any product um, over time. The multivariate and A-B testing um, learnings are situational, and I have any, like an example of that. So here's maybe an A-B test that you might run. Um, say, hey, gray, gray button versus blue button. Um, once that runs and you find that the blue button is the winner, you might say, okay, like, I guess colorful buttons are better. Here you run two colorful buttons against each other. Maybe the plum wins and you start to say, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, there's something in color theory that says that plum is more attractive or more urgent. Then you get to something like this where the change is much more subtle. It's just a background image change. And I start to lose the ability to explain why this is happening, and really anybody does. Um, but one of these will win, um, and there's really not much learning to be had here. It's completely situational. It's like it's only applicable to this situation, and I don't know how to reproduce this in the future. Whereas the learnings from usability, where I learn, say, um, like this pattern just doesn't work for our membership, that I can apply over and over again. This I can't. Um, next is the type of behaviors that can be observed or measured. So on this side, you'll get more nuanced information, but it can tend to be performative because we're seeing that person in person in a situation that's not native to them. On this side, it's concrete, but non-contextual. So we have actual data about what they did, but we don't have any context around why they might have done it. And then the last one I want to go over is the role of the product team. So um, I think this actually gets at the heart of uh, that question that I had earlier about um, product success. So um, a lot of people are really wanting to get toward the end of this because they think that it absolves them of all responsibility. So like A, B, multivariate, whatever. They think that once they get there, that it tells them what to do um, and finds the answers for them. 
I think it's more of a line from synthesis to stewardship. So over here it's synthesis. You're pulling in a lot of information from different people. You're synthesizing it and you're saying, like, here are the learnings that we have. Here's how we're going to improve the product before it releases. And then once it gets out there, you can't just like set it and forget it. It's, it's, the data should not drive what you're doing. Um, like I always say we're data driven all the time, but the data shouldn't be given the agency. Um, we need to be stewards of that data uh, and make sure that like we are not misusing it. Um, I think about being good stewards of the brand. I think about being um, good stewards of user experience. A lot of the things that you discover in AB or multivariate testing um, might damage the brand if you did it. Um, they might you know, change the experience for the worse. It's just that in that instance, we found that something won or lost, and our, in, our inclination is to just turn it on and move on. Um, but we really need to, as a whole team, be stewards of a good experience of um, a good brand experience. We, we, if we find that like threatening language works better, we don't want to use that. Um, if we find that uh, making the whole homepage about sales works better, but that's not our goal, um, or that's not the experience that we want to drive members to, then that's not working for us either. Um, but it's really about, throughout the whole process, understanding what kind of testing is going on, um, what it's doing for us, what kinds of questions it can answer, and making sure that we're responsible with that information. So, that's it for me. Um, any questions? Cool. Thanks.